tell you a little bit about what they do, and uh, then we're going to go to some questions about how this all happened for them. Good morning. Thank you for coming. I know you guys are um, on summer break, but this is really important, and I have some young students that work for me, so I really appreciate uh, that you take the extra time. My name is Tessa Learn. I am actually a native of Rochester. I was born in Olmstead County um, and ended up moving to Stewartville as a kid. My parents wanted me to have a really great education. They really liked the school system there. Um, went to nursing school, was a nurse at Mayo for six years, and got was bitten by the hospitality bug probably when I was 15 by a really awesome boss um, who really pushed us as 15-year-old employees to be to really kind of take it into our own hands. So. Long story short, I went to culinary school, started a catering business, and now um, own and operate a restaurant called Sante Restaurant, um, where the old Wongs used to be down by Kathy's, <coughs> and we are 85% farm to tables, and um, feature a lot of local art, local musicians, and do a lot of charity work as well. Hi, my name is Dharani Ramamurthy from Xylo Technologies. <laughs> Um, about myself, I moved to Rochester like 19 years ago. I came to this country. I'm originally from India. I came to this country in 1991 to pursue my master's degree in computer science, uh, all the way from uh, Chennai, India, which is the warmest place to Fargo, North Dakota. <laughs> so, so that's where I did my master's in computer science. So I graduated in 93 December. Moved to Rochester in 94 January. Again, you could uh, imagine how it is, but it's, at least I moved in the right direction. Not going up, I moved in the south from Fargo to Rochester. So I started my career at IBM as an IT contractor developing software. So my prime, primary skill is software development. Um, I worked there for like uh, uh, two and a half years, three years in IBM. Not as an IBM employee, as an IT contractor working for a company called Keen. Um, so I, I really enjoyed the job. <coughs> then after that, I was looking for a break, and then I, I got an another opportunity again to work as an IT contractor at Mayo Clinic, developing software, uh, like developing like radiology applications, like image viewer applications. So I worked there for five years in Mayo. Um, so five plus three years, eight years as an IT contractor working for someone else. So I thought, why can't I do it myself? Um, the, the timing was perfect. My wife got a full-time job at Mayo Clinic, so I said, okay, my mortgage is paid off, so I don't have to worry about my mortgage here. So um, the, the car payments, she'll take care. So I thought, let me jump into the business and start something on my own. So I was really passionate about like uh, f finding the right talent because I myself have worked along with other IT contractors in Mayo, so I know I, I understand what they need. So, so my primary thing is to find the right talent to Mayo, um, like a staff augmentation business. That's what we call like augmenting their IT staff at Mayo Clinic with contractors to get the projects done in time. So, so that's kind of our main focus. So I started the company back in 2000. So we are 13 years in business and uh, we have got some good, very good awards. In fact, I shared a couple of awards this year with both of them. Uh, we won the US Chamber, Chamber of Commerce Blue Ribbon Business Award. So, so we have we have done very well. Um, I'm really interested in coming and talking to this group. This is really the important thing. One thing I'll, I'll make it very short, then we can go in detail about it. IT talent. I'm all about IT information technology. Alan can talk a lot more about it. There is no unemployment at all in IT field. We are underemployed. I have challenges every day finding IT technology people uh, to work in my line of business. Um, we have been forced to go higher outside United States to bring in people under visas, but since Obama administration came in, even that has become challenge. They are saying, no, no, go find the local talent. We are not going to let you to bring people from outside. But we are, we are really, really handcuffed. There is not many people in Rochester or to to hire those kind of people. So that's where I think we should plant the seed at the very, very early stage in high school, IT. If you really get into IT, there's a lot of jobs around there. I was just telling someone, the starting job like in IT after a bachelor's degree in computer science is minimum 60 to $65,000.
that is in Midwest. If you go outside in the East Coast or West Coast, $80,000, $85,000. Like in interns in, in Google get paid $35 an hour plus all the benefits they get, like great food and stuff like that. So just a <laughs> college intent. So, so that's kind of what I want to say here, share my thing, and, I, and we can talk a little more about it. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Alan DeCarroll. I am a uh, Rochester native. I graduated from Mayo High School in 1993. Went off to college in uh, Fargo, North Dakota. I uh, have two degrees, English and political science. Um, which you might uh, find ironic since I own a web company in town. Uh, we, uh, we have uh, about 18, 19 employees right now. So uh, we are, I guess, Rochester's largest web design hosting application development company. Uh, we pretty much, do, if anything's related to the web, we do it. Um, <coughs> been doing that for about 15 years now. Uh, so back to, I guess, why my degree is in English and political science. Um, I was originally going to be a lawyer when I went through college. And I had that uncomfortable uh, phone call with my parents, probably about, it was close to my senior year when I told them that I was no longer gonna go to law school and that I was going to do this web thing that I kind of fell in love with. So um, we'll talk about that a little bit later today too about how being an entrepreneur isn't always the most, uh, uh, I don't know, it's kind of frowned upon. Uh, my parents weren't very excited when I said that I wanted to go off and do something by myself. Um, so there's challenges there, I think, with the stigma of being an entrepreneur and, and all the risk associated with it, things like that. Um, but obviously now my mother says, well, it worked out pretty well for you and she's forgiven me. But <laughs> <laughs> um, So that's kind, of, uh, that's kind of my story. I literally started in college in a fraternity house in Fargo, North Dakota. Started small as a freelancer, one guy doing, the, doing something I loved. And if you do a good job and uh, you know, treat enough people right, uh, you'll get more business from that. People, word spreads, and here you are, 15 years later. So, good morning. My name is Dan Butterfass. I'm an owner and guide for the Rochester Trolley and Tour Company. Um, I was just thinking at this table we could invite Garrison Keeler in to be the moderator because you're sitting next to a fellow English major. <laughs> <laughs> English majors have a pension for uh, entrepreneurship, perhaps. Um, I moved to Rochester in uh, late 1993 for the absurd reason that Rochester was uh, lied, lied very close to lots of good trout fishing. So that's why I came here in my early 20s, about 20 years ago. Um, so I'm a, I'm a Twin Cities, Hennepin County, uh, west suburb transplant down to Rochester, but have lived here longer than uh, my parents' house and basement, so I now call it my hometown. Um, I got started in, um, in tourism, in the trolley and tour company, kind of by luck, by accident, serendipity, uh, looking, finding something that you weren't looking for. Um, I owned a bookstore at one time for about six years, and with a background in literature, I always wanted to be close to books, words, writing, um, and in 2005, decided to go back to graduate school um, in order to become a teacher. And I went back to graduate school for creative writing with an emphasis in poetry. And at that time, graduate school was busy. I had young kids. But I had a little bit of time, and I was asking myself lots of questions, like, what could I possibly do with my own deep interests and skills, such as trout fishing, that I might put to good, <laughs> that I might put to good use that piece of people would uh, possibly pay, pay me for? And I started to look around, and I saw this wonderful niche that really wasn't being served in Rochester. 5,000 hotel rooms, 1.75 million annual visitors, with lots of time on their hands. And so it made sense that they needed this option, um, something more that they could do in between or after their clinic appointments or when they had a free day. So I really got started by asking questions. And I came up with an idea for an outdoor e eco-oriented guide service, and that quickly by again asking questions of hospitality staff, quickly morphed into a company that focused on Amish country, Mississippi River, Rochester, and the Twin Cities. Um, two of the three must-see places in my mind when visitors come to Minnesota, being the upper Mississippi Valley and the Twin Cities with maybe Duluth, Lake Superior, and the North Shore being third. And then we have this wonderful, unique other culture, the Amish culture, within a half an hour of Rochester. So thank you for inviting me to be on the panel.
Tessa, do you want to just um, start and tell us <coughs> how did you start your business? Sure. And I'll try to talk about it. Um, I actually started my business um, way, way back when I was about in third grade. Little did I know, I loved to cook. I, I absolutely dressed up as a chef every year. I ended up being a chemistry minor in college because that was like cooking. Um, my parents said, absolutely not. You're not going to culinary school. You're going to get your degree. My mom cried when I said I was going to be a doctor because I never have kids. I said, I'll be a nurse, whatever. Um, <laughs> so. It just kind of all, I, I made myself a promise and the day I graduated from college, everybody was excited. I actually wrote myself a note, I will only do this for five years and then I'm gonna do what I want. Um, so, got to Mayo, loved what I did. I had a really great job. Um, I was a bone marrow transplant nurse. Um, met my husband who came from a family of entrepreneurs. They're actually immigrants. Um, he works at Mayo, they own restaurants. And I kept throwing all these dinner parties, just dinner, and finally said, Tessa, we are going to go broke if you keep this up. Like, how do you turn this into a job? You seem to love this. And so that's kind of where, I think he was joking, or he thought he was joking, and actually that's kind of where it started. And I started thinking, how can I do this? What would it take to start a catering business? What would it take to go to culinary school? And so that's kind of where it ended up going. I said, okay, here's my business plan. Here's my mission statement. Here are my values. I'm going to culinary school, and this is how I'm going to write it off. And he was just kind of flabbergasted and said, Okay, um, <laughs> what do you say to your wife that says that to you? This, this is, he never wanted to own a restaurant because um, he was third generation restaurateur. He didn't want to be, but good sport about everything. And actually it's been a really fun journey. So it was, it was a lot of questioning and answering. Um, and I think owning and operating a restaurant is very similar to being a nurse. You know, you've got your patients who are your customers. You've got your, you know, surgeons who are your chefs and you've got your nurses who are your servers so it, to me and you give really good medicine which is food and wine so it totally made sense to me <laughs> so that's kind of how we started and then growing up here i worked up in the cities at restaurants and i saw like all of this food coming in from southern minnesota all these farms people that i'd grown up with and i thought wouldn't that be interesting if we started kind of showcasing what we do down here um and that's how it started now i can tell you um from third grade on, my teachers will tell you that I was the kid that always asked, why? How come? How do you make it better? I think I drove them crazy. But I had really good teachers that just kept channeling that and saying, okay, so you need, you need to show up, you need to do this. And that's like the best lesson that I ever learned from any of my teachers was, the people that show up, the people that participate are the ones that are gonna get to make the decision. So if you wanna be part of the decision-making process, you need to be there. So they made you, you know, join Storval was very old school back then, so if you said something, they just made you join us. So they put you on, you know, BPA, they put you in Future Farmers of America. They said, if you don't know how to build it, you should join shop. And the teachers pushed. So I think that a lot of where that kind of go get itness came from was from my, my teachers who never let you off the hook. So um, I blame my teachers and my first boss. <laughs> Same question? Yeah. Okay. How did you well, how did you get started? Why did you um, start your business? What, where, where were you at at the ground floor? Okay. So like I told you before in my introduction, I worked like for uh, three years in for one IT company in IBM and another five years uh, for an another IT company in Mayo. I said, okay, why don't I do it myself? So this, that that's kind of really a big challenge when I started. I don't have a business major. I only know IT technology. Um, so I thought, is it going to really happen or not? I was asked many, many times myself. Then I, I made many, many walks to the score office here in Rochester, asked them about, oh, how do I do this? Can you help me writing a business plan? And they said, oh, here it is. These are all the steps. I looked at all those. Oh, it takes me a month or two. I'm not a good writer to go sit and write the business plan, but I really know what I can do. So I said, skip the business plan. I'm not going there. I know what I want to do. I have my relationships intact. The only challenge I had is I cannot do business with Mayo Clinic because someone introduced me to Mayo Clinic. So I had a big non-compete. So I have to quit my job at Mayo to make that leap. So like I said before, my wife got the full-time job that was good. I said, okay, let me take the leap. And I was looking for a job Every job which came on way is all from Twin Cities, but I like to stay in Rochester. I love Rochester. 
Um, so that's the time the Seagate in Rochester, if you remember, they have opened up that built that building on the Circle Drive. Now it's a mayor support center. So they came to town and then um, they closed the office and there are quite a lot of unemployed people with a lot of good technical skills. Then and another company came, Seagate. So they hired all those people and then I saw a opening in Post Bulletin, I'm looking for programmers. I said, why don't I apply for the job? So I applied for the job. So the, the first question they asked is, oh, you want to be an employee, right? Nope, I don't want to be an employee, I want to be a contractor. Tell me what is a contractor, because they really don't know what IT contract is all about. Then I explained them what they do. Oh, I said, they said it's really a good idea. So if I don't like you, I could fire you in two months. Yes, you are, you can do that. <laughs> so, so that's kind of where that the opportunity presented itself, plus I had the experience. I said, let me just jump into the leap. And that kind of started. So no business plan. I didn't go to a bank to write my <coughs> finance or anything like that. Just started the job. I worked for them for like eight months. Then the year 2000 thing came again. You know, the IT went and a slump. But my intacts, are the, my contacts at Mayo was very, very good. So I knocked the door again. They said, come on over. We are willing to take you over. My non-compete was done. A year non-compete is done. Then I went back to Mayo and then continued the business. So that's kind of where I started. So it's all experimental. I said, I want to do something myself. That's for sure. Plus one other couple of things I could mention again, my friends who graduated from Fargo, North Dakota, they moved to Twin Cities, they started their business, and I've been talking to them. They were very, very helpful in that process. So that's kind of where I started, so. I didn't have a business plan either, but I had, uh, I had a great idea, and I saw the future of where, where things were gonna go. And I was lucky enough that uh, when I was in college, uh, they signed me up for a credit card that had a credit limit on it. So I used that uh, as my funding to get started, which wasn't much. But um, literally, as I went, uh, literally have just spent when I had money and grew when I had it. That little bit of a $5,000 credit line to, to buy the next thing that I needed or buy a computer to work on or whatever it might be. And then uh, you know, get some money in the door and, and grow a little bit. Get some more money in the door and grow. And literally, uh, that's what it's been for the last 15 years. And, and we've probably added about one employee every year. And literally, that just comes from having more work than I could do myself. I mean, that's what it started out with. I started out as a freelancer, building websites, passionate about what I was doing. It was, it was fun. I loved it. It was one of those things that uh, you know you don't want to go to bed at night because you just want to stay up and work on it. You want to learn more. You want to you know know more about the industry. What are people doing? And those are the people that I look for when I'm looking to hire now. Those people who have that passion about the web or about the technology, about where things are going, about what the future holds for mobile devices. And <coughs> those people who just they love to learn about it. They're reading blogs. They're they're constantly on the up and up about where the industry is going. Um, because frankly, that's what it takes in our industry. I mean, l literally, I cannot, uh, you know, I look to people who are in college now, and I know that whatever they're probably teaching them in college today is going to be completely different four years from now in our industry. Um, Apple's going to come out with a new iPad 5 or, you know, new mobile devices, whatever it might be. And our industry is going to completely change because we're going to now need to adapt for whatever <laughs> the devices that people are going to be using five years from now. And we don't know what those are. So I look for those people who are like me, that love to just figure out what's next, where are things going, and love to go read blogs, love to go figure out what other people are doing, why are they doing it that way, is that the right way, is that the wrong way, and that's what we look for. So I was one of those types of person that just that loved to do that, loved to figure things out. Um, looking back, what I've loved to, uh, I mean I was fortunate, I, actually my senior year of college, I worked for a, a web company that was up in Fargo and I was literally finishing my school and I was director of commercial sales for this web company and flying around and meeting with clients and that company, to my benefit, it ultimately imploded and went bankrupt. But I had the opportunity to go and steal a few of those clients and say, hey, I, I'm still here, I'll help you, you know, um, and, and got, to, got the advantage of taking some of them and gave me my base really to kind of get started with so I had something to work with. and. Um, and from there, it's just kind of been a slow growth procedure for me. And uh, it's been a lot of fun. All right. um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how I got started, but, but mainly, uh, mainly about why. Um, 
I, I really got started in tourism by wandering the back roads. Um, just with, uh, um, I have some background in journalism, and I, I think the mark of a, of a good journalist, uh, somebody who writes pieces that you always want to read, is an intellectual uh, curiosity about whatever a aspect of the world the journalist is writing about. So, I, being a solitary type, I love to wander the back roads, and I've always had interests in whatever region or whatever city I'm living in, and I, and I've always been a reader. So. Um, I kind of use that journalistic curiosity to, you know, read about the Mississippi River Valley, um, go out and meet, I like to meet people and, and uh, talk to people, and went out and made friends in Amish country, uh, did a lot of research on the fascinating story of the Mail Brothers, and then I started to see, wow, you know, I, I, I love to read about all this, I'm passionate about it, but like everything, after a while, um, it doesn't have the same zip anymore unless you share it with someone else. And so I decided, okay, we could start a series of tours, you know, um, based on Amish country, based on the history, ecology, scenery, natural history of the Mississippi River Valley, and then incorporate some of these new wonderful sites and attractions that started to blossom, like the Eagle Center, uh, like the Marine Arts Center. And we have this um, wonderful captive audience here in Rochester with visitors from around the country and the world in the Mayo Clinic. So we really got started by taking out private um, guests on private tours, guests from hotels. I call our first, this is our eighth full tour season, and I call our first five or six years kind of the underground years. We really weren't on the radar in Rochester. People in the hotels knew about us because we were taking out guests on private tours, and we're talking couples, people here uh, solo, you know, occasionally a family group, but we did hundreds if not thousands of these private tours, and I think what that taught us is to deliver a really high quality tour, um, to be generalists rather than specialists in the region and in Rochester, and to deliver this kind of tour with a really personal service, and one thing I'll talk about when we talk about challenges is now we're trying to deliver that really high quality tour um, uh, in a really personal personal way to bigger and larger audiences via our trolleys. Um, I took the leap of faith, I guess. I think every business owner needs to take a leap of faith. Uh, artists take a leap of faith. You believe in what you do, and we added the trolleys um, in uh, about two years ago, May, June of 2011. Okay, thinking about yourselves as entrepreneurs, what are the key skills that you needed to um, start your business and grow your business. What did it take from you? Um, it took a couple things. It took uh, resiliency. <clears throat> it took the uh, the um, the big one is the uh, willingness to fail, which is really scary. Um, and and the critical thinking to if you see a failure, how do you turn it into a win or a positive? Um, that's something that when you work for somebody, if something goes wrong, it's always kind of that boss's fault. Now it's it's my problem to solve. And I, I think you have to want to kind of be a natural problem solver. Um, it's stressful, but I think that that, that is the critical thinking skills that um, you learn along the way are incredibly, incredibly important. Um, and you have to be, I think, an optimist um, because entrepreneurship and business is tough, but a lot of times those lemons turn into like some really amazing lemonade um, for some things. So I think those are kind of the big ones. And curiosity. Um, those, you know, <clears throat> I can't say it enough, and my parents will tell you, I was the kid that asked why all the time. And how come? And why can't we do it this way? And what about this? And But that natural kind of, well, I'm just not going to take no for an answer, really kind of works out. They might be the most frustrating people you've ever been around, but they might actually be <laughs> some of the funnest to come up with some wacky <laughs> ideas and, and make them work. So for, for me, especially in the hospitality, you have to you have to grow a thick skin, um, but you don't do it overnight, and, and you can you know cry in your bathtub once a month if you want, but you tell <laughs> nobody about it until it's done. And then you usually come up with an amazing idea when you wake up in the morning. Sure, definitely. I echo whatever Tessa said here. In my case, I think persistence and hard work is what two important skills entrepreneurs need to have. 
um, I'll give my, myself an example. For example, I, when I said I want to start a company, the, the goal I had is like, I want to develop software for clients. That's my true, when I said, if you want to write a business plan, if you have an idea, give it to me, I will develop the software application. That's kind of where I started. When I started selling this idea to my major client at that point is Mayo, their culture is totally different. They said, nope, we will develop everything internally here. We will not give it to you outside. If you want, give me resources. So basically my whole plan has changed. Instead of developing software on my own, you give me the specifications, I develop the software. They said, give me people. So we have changed from more like a, 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 a really a product company to more into a services firm, finding people for them. But I, but I accepted it, that's fine, let us just do it. Let us excel in that. There are so many staffing companies, I don't, if you have noticed, I'm not very used staffing. This is the very first time I use staffing. This is not, this is a very, very common in the thing. There are so many uh, uh, companies do the same thing what we do because there is no capital involved. You just have an access to job boards. You, you have a good client relationship, you can start the business. But the main differentiation I showed in Zylo compared to my competition is most of the recruiters work in those companies are like history majors or they doesn't know anything about IT. They just know keywords. Okay, those people need Java. Oh, there's a resume in Java here, so let us just match and send it to them. <laughs> what I do is I talk to them. I understand because I worked in the field. I talk to them, I interview them, and say, hey, is this the right person for the right <coughs> job? Plus, I had some advantage working in Mayo for five years. I know the culture of Mayo, what works, what does not work. So those are all some of the things I kind of learned. Again, it was a persistence, hard work. Those two I keep saying. One other thing I always say, again, this is something I'm learning on my here. When I, when I used to work for those eight years, eight to five, Monday to Friday, great. After that, enjoy. <laughs> Nothing. Just go learn whatever, like watch basketball. Like I, I know I, how many hours I spent watching Michael Jordan in those <laughs> NBA things. But since I started the business, everything gone away. I have to work again, like I started as a single employee. I have to spend so much time. I don't mind calling people on the weekends. Someone, even, in fact, I, I call them on a Sunday late in the evening. Are you really calling from Rochester, Minnesota? Are you not calling from India? That's kind of a lot of recruiters now work from <laughs> India. So I said, no, nope, I work here. Oh, is that right? That's good. So I'd like to work with a company who's really about this. So, so that's kind of about hard work, persistence is what two important skills like entrepreneur need to have. Yeah, I mean, along those same lines, my, my top two, again, were, were passion and determination. Because if you, if you don't love what you do, you're not going to want to spend hours upon hours doing it. And it's literally going to take hours and hours to, to make it happen. The determination to never give up, because I think a lot of people will give up too early um, before they have the opportunity really to see the, the fruits of the efforts they, they put in thus far. Um, and the ability and desire to learn, because uh, whatever it is, is always going to be changing. So you really need to have the ability to be able to do that. If I just add beyond that, I would say one thing I talk about often, well, with my staff and if I go talk to students, I, I talk about above the, above the line behavior. And if you, if you think of a line, above the line is ownership, accountability, and responsibility for your actions. Below the line is things like blame, excuse, and denial. And everybody has opportunities all through their life to either have above the line behavior or below the line behavior. And in business we have that too when, you know, th business isn't going well and, you know, you can easily say, well, you know, the economy tanked, so that's why we're not doing well. Or you can say, well, it's, it, you know, you, that's that's below line type thing. You're, you're making excuses or you're in denial as to what's really going on in your business. <laughs> or you can take, stay above the line and say, okay, I'm going to take ownership for this. Why are we really failing? Maybe I didn't cut back, you know, enough staff early enough. Maybe we didn't get into the right markets early enough. You know, so there's always that opportunity to either always be above the line or below the line, and I think um, that's a real key trait: is to not just make excuses why things are going bad or why you're not doing well, um, but really always stay above the line and make your staff stay above the line and don't allow them to always have excuses. Well, you know, we didn't make enough sales this month because of X, Y, Z. That's not an answer. What you know, let's stay above the line to take ownership for that and come up with a reason why we could have done it better. So I would just add that. 
I, right with this uh, question, I guess I differentiate a little bit between qualities and skills, um, between the inherent and the learned. Uh, or to put it another way, what can be enhanced through education and what can be taught through it. Um, skills in creating a, a tour company, uh, reading, writing critically, uh, definitely the art of listening, um, public speaking, which does not come naturally to me at all, even though I've taught at RCTC for three and a half years. Um, I learned that by doing you know, kind of what we were all forced to do in Speech 101 in high school. Um, so those are some of, the, some of the skills. I think um, more importantly, I mean, education uh, can definitely en enhance the qualities that it takes to be an entrepreneur. entrepreneur. And in my experience, uh, the, the two starting points were creativity and vision. Um, <coughs> lots of adaptability, being flexible along the way. Adaptability is a big thing. And I would, I would echo uh, my fellow panel members when I say persistence and determination above all else. Uh, without those last two, I would have been out of business long ago. Um, lastly, I think you have to have guts to go into business. You have to trust your gut and your instinct as you learn as much as you can about your industry. But in the end, you have to trust your gut and go with your instincts. Um, I'll just, one little visual. When I was teaching at RCTC, uh, one of my fellow uh, instructors had this posted in the hallway, and I tore it down and made a copy. It's, maybe you know it, press on, but it ends with, uh, unrewarded genius is almost a proverb, Educa education won't do it, the world is full of educated derelicts. Persistence and determination alone are omnipotent. And I've kept this above my desk, I took it down to bring here today. Um, that's really what's kept me going, is uh, just sticking with it and believing in your vision, having a philosophy, and trying to stay true to it along the way. Thank you. Um, Dan, I'm going to start with you this time. What do you wish you'd learned more about the school relative to becoming an entrepreneur? Okay. Um, well, my background is, is in a private liberal arts college and then a, a fine arts college. Um, so my formal education was really almost entirely on the theory side rather than the practical side of education. So I might come at this a, a little differently by uh, making a distinction between um, lower order skills and, and higher order skills, you know, like critical thinking and problem solving. But for me, um, I came up into entrepreneurship and business with a real dearth or lack of uh, lower order skills. And I didn't even take typing in high school, and I'm a writer, I'm a learn to hunt and pack really well. I wish I'd taken typing. Um, but I, I really wish I'd learned to become more adept at mastering the small daily technologies um, that we need as entrepreneurs to survive first and then to thrive. Um, I've had to play catch up with QuickBooks, Excel, PowerPoints, Microsoft Office, and so on and so forth. Um, they, these things don't come very naturally to me. Um, but in the end, I think the most valuable thing a student can take from their formal education are the higher level skills, uh, with the main ones being able to think creatively and being able to think critically, and to come up with your own unique ways of doing things um, and your own well thought out solutions to problems. So, yes. Looking back, I think the one thing that I, that I think about now that I was flabbergasted that I never ever was taught throughout, whether it was high school or college, nobody ever taught me about money, ever. About how to manage a checkbook, how to balance a checkbook, how much stuff costs. The only thing I ever learned about about money and budgets and finance was really what, my, what I learned from my parents and what my parents did. That was the only influence I ever had about how to manage money, about how much things cost. And I really think we should do a better job about teaching our young people about money and how to manage money, um, how, to, how to spend less than you make, things like that. <laughs> you know, simple things like that. Um, because I, I didn't learn that. You know, I literally, when I was in college, I was given a bunch of credit cards and things like that and never had any responsibility as far as, you know, oh, I got a $5,000 credit limit they just gave me. I don't even have a job yet, but they, they gave this to me. And, you know, I went and racked up money and racked up bills and things like that. And looking back, I'm thinking, 
why didn't everybody tell me that credit cards are bad and that you pay interest on them and all those basic things that, that catch people, especially young people, so, so often. And I see so many young kids today that are, that are graduating from college with $75,000 in debt with you know, an art degree or something, and I think, you know, how are you going to make this work? How are you going to pay this bill? How are you going to just pay for everything you just racked up? And they don't think about that. They say, oh, I haven't got that far yet. I'll figure that out later. And it just it, it, it pains me to see that because I think, oh, you know, they, they just have so much to learn about that realm of managing money and spending less than you make. Um, for me, I think it's business management. That's something I think I lack. I wish I, I did like more there because I was more a technology guy. I, all my high school, math major, then going to college, I did my electronics and communication <coughs> engineering. I never had a business background. I wish I had. I always dreamed of doing an MBA. Even today, I couldn't get to it. I started the business. I thought at least I want to do an executive MBA. But that's still in my wish list. I've not done it. That's one thing I thought if I, if I have a chance, I could have been a little more successful knowing the business nuances about running a business. So. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a little different. Um, I actually had a teacher, I said I don't know anything about money, and so she made me sign up for Business Professionals of America and then made me stay with it for three years. So that I was okay with. The one thing I look back and I, and I wish, um, really wish that, that somebody could have focused me is that a lot of times as a, as a kid, you're, you think you're supposed to be doing what everybody's telling you to do. So, you know, you're really good at science and you're really good at chemistry or you're really good. You should go into healthcare. My parents are very practical. You should go and get a job in healthcare so you have health insurance. That was kind of their rationing where the fact that I was putting on, you know, events for the teachers and running a restaurant in the school and running the prom and running all these events was kind of my natural calling. And so sometimes it's, I think, I. That's the one thing I think if you could ever do is take a step back and say, like, what are you naturally drawn to? Instead of saying, what's going to get you the biggest paycheck and what's going to and what's going to you know get you a hundred thousand dollars a year? Because Donald Trump once said, and he's you know he is who he is, but he did say, if you love what you do, the the money will eventually come. And sometimes the money's. I, I had a great job. I had a great job at Mayo. It was safe. It was secure. I had vacation. I wasn't working eight hours a week, but I wasn't happy. Um, and so it took finding what my passion was to really, really set me free and to do what I want to do. And it's not always easy, but if you go back, I was just looking at my box of stuff from school this weekend because I was cleaning my garage. And I was like, look, I, I really did like putting out events. I really did organize. I really did do that. And I start looking at all my friends from high school, what they're doing for jobs now. That was kind of all part of our personalities. So a lot of times you kind of know where you're, you probably did something like that as a kid. All of you probably did. And so it's just finding, that, giving yourself permission to explore that instead of saying, I'm gonna go to college and get a four year degree as an art history major because I think that might be when in fact, do you love art? How else could you make that work for you? So that was what I wish I would have done differently. Okay, what would, are your biggest challenges, or what were your biggest challenges when you started your business? And how did you actually um, overcome those challenges? What did you do with your critical thinking process to overcome them? Joanna, you want to start? Sure. Initially, I means like, I, I know the business idea, I want to do it. It's more hiring the talent. Even today, I really admit one thing I, I can't do well in the company is building talent around me. Um, primarily the sales side. Um, our company, or whatever the line of business is more about networking, um, connecting to people. I don't drink, I don't golf. That is two biggest, weakest links I have. <laughs> I wish I had, I played tennis, but tennis doesn't bring business at all. <laughs> So that's my two weakest links. I, I, I wish uh, I, I, I can do it, but I, I cannot start drinking now. I tried it. It's not like because of the religion or anything like that. I didn't like the taste, so that's the, that's the thing. The golf, I'm into tennis. I play almost three days tennis a week. That takes more of my time, so I don't want to learn a new sport. So, so that's one thing I feel like if I can find good talent around me to support me, to support my vision. 
I think I could have grown a lot better. So that's kind of my stumbling block right now. We came to this level. I want to jump to the next level. I wish I, I could do that in Rochester, but maybe I may have to go to, to Twin Cities to do that, to find the talent, because the talent is there in Twin Cities, but they are not willing to come. So that's my biggest challenge, if, I, if you ask me today. I, I'm going to touch on, I guess, what not so much a, a challenge from the beginning, but a, a challenge now. And it goes back to what Durrani said earlier, and that's finding talent. Um, we have several open positions right now for people. One's a system administrator, one is a web application programmer. And um, it's been a challenge. It's a, it's a challenge in Rochester, Minnesota. One, because you're competing with Mayo Clinic, who's here. They also want those positions. Um, but the other challenge is really is that Rochester, Minnesota is not that exciting of a place to a 22-year-old. Um, you know, there's not, a, there's not the college life here, there's not all those activities, and I think it's, it's changing, it's getting a lot better, but it's definitely a challenge for us to try and convince people to, to live and start a family in Rochester, Minnesota. And, um, you know, we do, we do all kinds of things at our company, I mean, you talk about Google and all they have free grapefruit, but I mean, we, we, have, a, we have a foosball table. The guys are often playing foosball. You know, we do free lunches, we do happy hours, we do all kinds of things like that because that's really one thing that can differentiate us from some of the other places like the big corporations that they might go to is, you know, this is a fun place to work, this is a fun place to be at. We give you the flexibility to, to work remote, to have those things and have the flexibility. And um, it, it's a challenge, it definitely is a challenge. There are not enough programmers, there are not enough IT technical people out there today and he's right. If they went in, the, if somebody went in that field and learned that that programming language or whatnot for the web, there there will be jobs in that industry for many many years to come. So it's definitely a uh, an area that if somebody enjoys computers, enjoys technology, they should definitely choose that as a field because there are lots and lots of jobs available, and they're getting paid very well. I know because I have to pay them. <laughs> I'll just add one quick thing, particularly the girls. I, I wish more girls go to the computer program. They all think it's so hard. It's not really hard. And uh, if, it, if I look back my home in India, a uh, lot of girls is now going to computer programming because they just want to sit in a desk and work. They don't want to do the hard job. So this is that kind of a thing like programming. You just sit. So that's kind of where I thought this group talk to the girls boys of course they say oh comes and goes sports but girls is they they would like to focus i think that's kind of where the next big leap in the united states if it all come from women going into technology well a, a big challenge for us as a tour company um, has been the mindset that alan was speaking to um, namely that uh, rochester is a, a boring place surrounded by cornfields with nothing to do except go up to the Mall of America. <laughs> and unfortunately, unfortunately, I think this, everything's changing for the better. Um, there's more to see and do here than ever before, but still that mindset persists. And that was a real challenge when we started back in 2006, because we would go around with our tour materials. We created uh, photo books of, of Amish country and the Mississippi River Valley, Rochester's highlights, and we would find that um, hospitality, the hospitality industry, um, workers in hotels were largely telling us, well, there's really not much to do here. Um, and, and I think over the decades that mindset got ingrained in the visitor population, the Mayo Clinic. You know, Mayo's wonderful, but oh, Rochester, you know, it's, uh, it's really boring. And so we have been up against this mindset from the get-go. Um, granted, you know, I'm, I'm a realist and an optimist at the same time. We have the ear of Corn Tower and not the Eiffel Tower. <laughs> but, but I come from, I come at this from the mindset that every place you go, in every region, every country, you know, every state is is really as interesting as the next place. It's its own unique place with its uh, fascinating stories and things to to see and do. And and so I've always found Rochester and Southeast Minnesota um, to be you know really interesting places to live. And again, want to want to share that. But the challenge has been overcoming that mindset. Um, just two quick examples to illustrate what I'm talking about. 
Um, I had some guests from the Middle East out on a private tour. We were between St. Charles and Waynesboro, surrounded by cornfields. And she said, Dan, stop the car. And I said, okay, right in the middle of the cornfields on a, on a highway. I said, what is it? She said, I just want to get out and look at the corn. It is so lush and green. So cornfields can be fascinating to people. Where, where she was from, you know, there isn't a lot of lush uh, green vegetation. Another couple um, called for an Amish country tour. It was January, we were getting six, seven inches of snow. Not dangerous, but enough to make you think twice about going out. And they called and they said, um, we want to take an Amish country tour. I said, okay, I mean, we're going to have to take it slow because of the snow. And they said, that's absolutely why we want to go. It's snowing. They were from the Canary Islands. Uh, they'd never seen snow before. So these, these things, snow, cornfields, that uh, we take for granted what's right before our eyes can be really fascinating to someone who's not from this area. And um, we need to see Rochester in the region with new eyes and from a fresh perspective. So we're trying to help overcome that challenge. Um, to reiterate what both Durrani and Alan said, it's it's the talent. It's finding the talent. Is um, and for anything, I think Rochester. We're very lucky here. It's it's a growing city, but a lot of talent is taken up by the Mayo Clinic. And even for a simple, you would think for a simple server, but even for that, we have such a high level of guests coming in and the people here who want to learn things. So you have to have people who really want to be there. Our servers. Um, at least where, where we're at, they all have degrees. They all, um, three of them have their own businesses. They do this as supplemental, but they do it because there's a passion. And that for any business to be really great, you need to have passionate workers who are willing to work above the line. And I think that's, um, that's a really huge um, challenge that I think you did as a, I had no idea. I thought, well, who well, we wouldn't want to do this. This is so fascinating to me. <laughs> Um, so it's, it's inspiring, you know, other people to be passionate about food and wine and local produce and, and that type of thing, but just even passionate about your business. So if you're not there and somebody comes in, they're excited to tell people. They're excited to brag about your business, um, and they take ownership. And then the other thing um, I'd like to point out in Durrani's uh, thing is um, encourage girls to be bossy. Encourage them to take leadership roles. I think I had some very... <clears throat> very forward-thinking teachers back in the 80s and 90s um, that really said you can do it just because you're a girl is not a reason you should be you should be doing this and and for them to say that's okay you can do this it doesn't always have to be a boy um, and I I look forward to sitting on entrepreneur panel where there's one man and three women someday no offense guys <laughs> Um, how can the K-12 and higher education systems encourage entrepreneurialism? Alan, um, you know, I think I think they can start by encouraging it. Um, you know, I think that we have this stigma where people are just expected to finish high school and then go off to college, and um, there's, it, that's not right for everybody. Um, you know, there's a lot of the, the high entrepreneurs you hear about, like Mark Zuckerberg, that went to college and then they ended up dropping out because they realized it wasn't for them. Um, and they didn't really need that because they had this passion and this vision for something they wanted to do and nothing was gonna stop them. So why, why spend another three years finishing college when I can just go do this? So recognize that it is, it is an opportunity for some people. You know, if you see a, if you see a student that is, is passionate about something, you know, and they're always talking about, they're always bringing their, whatever it is, skateboard, constantly, you know, always talking about skateboards, learning about skateboards, you know, maybe encourage them and say, hey, you know, is there, is there an opportunity here? Because when you look at all of our businesses, right, we found a niche, we found a, a, a certain thing that there was an opportunity out there that was not being met by others. And we turned it around and we turned around and we figured out a way to monetize it. And we now get to do what we love and other people get what they want and they need. So it's a win-win for everybody. So. Uh, just recognize that entrepreneurship should be should be one of the avenues or the opportunities that people can go down, and it always doesn't have to be either you know go get a blue collar job, go to college, or or whatever. Those are your two options. Um, it doesn't have to be that way, and there shouldn't be this stigma about being an entrepreneur either. I think especially with the young kids today, this generation Y, they tend to I think there's a stigma with entrepreneurship, and they think 
big corporate companies make all this money, greedy, you know, that whole stigma around being a business owner. And the reality is actually the opposite. When you look at where the money comes from, giving to charities and things like that, I mean, I, I see these names often on local charities where we're giving money, we're giving our time, our talent to those charities, and there's so many opportunities to give back at the local level with being involved in a small company. So um, there's, there's opportunity to do good, too, and not just the corporate greed and all those things that we sometimes get labeled with. <clears throat> One thing I, I kind of always puzzle still about the summer vacation for this high school students. Example, I have a son, he's in fact, I see that my uh, Lutz High School, he goes to Lutz High School. I couldn't really figure out what they do in summer, two months, just the video games. Is there anything better they can do? I, I talk to my son many, many times, oh, this is what we do, leave me alone. I just do every time during the school year. I feel like something as a, as a system we have to do, involve them in the summer. I know that other thing I couldn't still figure it out, the sports, how much importance we give to sports in this country, which is good, but how many really and really a sports person finally they succeed? Very little. Most of them still go work a regular job. So that's one thing my view is like, give importance to education more. Sports is fun, good, have that one. In summer, involve the kids in some fashion to come back to school, like entrepreneurism or anything what they like. I think that kind of a curriculum to be developed, we should not let the kids to just stay home for two or three months. It's just killing them. He just, I, I kind of really puzzle when I see my own son, he wakes up until like midnight, like 12 or one playing video game and get up at 10 o'clock in the morning. I'm saying, Anish, you have to figure it out. Like, you have to go to school now in another month. How can you sleep early, get up, like, uh, get up early in the morning to go to school? That's one thing I, I don't know, this group can figure it out. Involve students in summer. Uh, I, I, that's one, my thing I, I thought I'd share. Um, ha having stood up in front of a whiteboard for three and a half years, pouring it on, uh, the students, I, 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 really, I really think that today's students need to be convinced, almost sold on the value of their education, and truly convinced that the skills, the material that they're learning will be relevant to their future, um, and will have lasting value at some point in their careers. Um, I, I saw that at RCTC. So, in order to be a better teacher, I kept trying to ask myself um, how what I'm teaching applies to the outside world of work. And I, I think that's one thing that we can do as educators. I think also, you know, with, with middle class shrinking, we're really seeing two ways to financial success, and maybe a third way, but with, with manufacturing shrinking, the middle class shrinking, uh, blue collar jobs, you know, you, you can't get a job at Hormel anymore um, in the factory um, and raise a family on, you know, a single income. Those, those days are, are way gone. Um, I really think, you know, you've got the go to college for four years and um, climb the corporate uh, world of work, climb the corporate ladder, so to speak. And, and I think there is a new way, um, and I think a lot of students are embracing it if they don't see themselves as, you know, nine to five, Monday through Friday, and that's entrepreneurship. And I would say for every Mark Zuckerberg or Bill Gates who drops out of college and achieves a phenomenal success, um, there's entrepreneurs that went to college and the skills they gain in college, they may have gone to school for something completely different than what they end up doing in their business. But it's those higher level skills, critical thinking, um, problem solving, um, team building, you know, that you gain in college that, that really can make a difference in your, in your business. <clears throat> I'm a little bit simpler. Um, I, I encourage teachers, and Mo has been part of this, and the United Way has been part of this. We actually take students that, um, the Chamber's been part of this, we take students that think they want to work in the culinary field, and we let them come in and work. Um, and, and some of them it's a really good fit, some of them it's an eye opener, some of them we say, you're really good. We had one gentleman, really thought he wanted to be in the cooking field, ended up he was an amazing cleaner, and I think he's gonna start his own cleaning company, who knew? So I think sometimes just giving them 
out of the classroom. Um, for me, that was, I, I, again, I had, I really had some really good teachers. I'm very, I should write them all thank yous. Um, but they really, they said, this doesn't seem like a really great fit for you. You're good at it, but you don't seem happy doing it. How do we get you out of the classroom? And how do we get you maybe just for an hour or two to meet this business owner or, or go work at this restaurant or see? And I think those opportunities in Rochester really existed. My, and I think a lot of times if you give a business a call and you have a student like that, and I know you have a lot of students, but you, you usually have that was one or two that just need that and it opens up a whole other door for them that might not you know, necessarily be a traditional four-year degree, but... You know, um, and the other thing is read, have them read some interesting books like Rich Dad, Poor Dad. If you want to learn about finances, if you want to learn about the most multi, the biggest millionaires, a lot of them only have a high school education and started owning car wash companies. I mean, who knew that? I mean, those, those are the things that you kind of open up and a light bulb goes off. It's not a traditional way of thinking and that's, and that's okay. I would just quickly add, um, I think educators could bring in you know, business owners, uh, professionals from the community as guest speakers, so that not only you can you can try to convince kids that what they're learning is going to be relevant, but when you actually show them, you know, when you bring in someone from the outside um, who talks in real ways about the value of what they learned in school and how it applies to their life and how it's made a difference, I, I think that um, can have a profound effect. Yeah, I, I was going to say that that same thing. I, I've went, I've spoken at business classes at both Century and Mayo High School and um, I, I wrote a book back in 2010 called Jobless and it's not jobless in the sense that I don't have a job but jobless in the sense that now I'm free to do what I want and I have some more freedoms and things like that but it's a, it's a book about entrepreneurship and those business classes I actually read that book and then I come in and I talk. So I think again having entrepreneurs come in and talk and, and show that uh, the results of being an entrepreneur, what, what can happen, uh, is a good thing too. And then internships, I think, is another great thing. Just uh, encourage your students to get out and go spend a month at a company and offer their time. Um, it gives them a flavor for, for what it's like in the real world, and I think that's important. So encourage them to do internships. Okay, um, this is the last question that I'm going to ask you because then I want to take a little time for um, our participants to ask some questions, but what advice would you offer um, to a student who has an interest in owning his own business or her own business? Hmm. Passion, passion, passion. Don't give up. And if you have an idea, everybody, I think it's much like what uh, Dan's press on said, if you have an idea, you have to write it down because everybody has a million great ideas, but until you commit that somewhere where you can look at it and review it and put it up for review from yourself and your family and whoever, it's not gonna, it's it's great to dream, but to become an entrepreneur, that dream has to be committed somewhere and that and you've just committed it to paper. Best, best advice I ever got in my life because I really was like, oh, it would be super fun to have a restaurant. Um, but you know, then you start putting it down, and actually, it, I became more passionate about it once I started. You know, even when the when I would think about the problems, I would I would have a way to solve them on paper, so or on computer now, whatever people do. Um, but that was kind of you've got to you've got to commit to it, if, and if maybe you end up doing it and you don't like it, and maybe something else completely comes out of that that you love even more. I say start early, uh, try things. Two things I like here is that lemonade stands in summer I see when I drive by the kids selling lemonade. That's a good thing to start. I start selling something. So you know how hard to attract those people to come and stop the car and buy the things from you. So that's one example. The second example I always see the, the neighborhood kids dropping newspaper, making money. That's another great thing to do. Like, so you know you make some money, that you have some fun, you have some accountability, you have to be at that point when the guys drop the newspaper, pick it up, you have to go distribute. Those are all the things I, I feel that we should encourage more and uh, that's kind of what I felt, those two, go ahead. I had a paper route all growing up. <laughs> I made sure the papers were there on time, I learned that, yes. Um, you know, what, what, what advice would I offer a student? Um, at some level, I would encourage them to talk to some sort of other business owner if they can, if they can get the opportunity to go talk to some other business owner. Because there's, there's a, 
I see this all the time. People have ideas in a way that they can monetize something. They, they're passionate about something, but can you make money off of it? And a lot of times I, I look at it as, as a business owner with a little bit of experience and you just think, that's not going to work. You know what I mean? You, you just think the market share either isn't big enough for that or you know things like that. So very quickly you have to rule out whether or not it's a good idea and is there a big enough market share for it. Um, because just because you make the best you know, rhubarb, lemon, pecan pie and your grandma loves it doesn't mean that you're going to be able to sell it to other people. So um, encourage them to, to hook up with some sort of entrepreneur or go talk to SCORE about their idea because um, there's going to be a lot of things that are going to be relevant to talk about before you dig in too deep or invest too much because um, we've all probably made a lot of mistakes the hard way and luckily we've survived them. Um, but a lot of businesses don't survive them, and that's why you hear that 50% of all businesses fail within two to three years. It's either because they weren't that good of ideas in the first place, or maybe they just missed it a little bit, um, and you have to figure those things out before they make you perish. <laughs> <laughs> I think it, it does all start with a creative idea, and as Tessa said, a, a passion uh, for that idea. And then above and beyond, I would echo, commit your ideas to paper. Um, that's an advice I would give a student. Don't keep them up here, put them down on paper. I still have to force myself to do that. I have a great new tour. Um, but, but that can be really helpful. Uh, beyond that, I, I wouldn't want to scare them off, but I, I would have some um, pretty serious advice. And I'm just going to read what I, what I prepared here on this. There's a poet that I, I, and, and writer that I really admire. Um, and, He's getting older now, aspiring writers often come and seek him advice, young writers, and he always admonishes them with this first piece of advice. Don't do it unless you're willing to give your whole life over to it. And I, I think the same advice applies to aspiring entrepreneurs. At least initially, you have to be willing to make tremendous sacrifices of time and treasure. There is worry and fear. Will I be successful? And what if I'm not? Then what? I poured my whole life into this. And if after several years, what if I don't have much to show for it? You know, then what? Um, for me, the antidote to all that has been persistence, determination, and keeping in mind that an entrepreneur really shouldn't go into business thinking he or she is going to make a lot of money. If you're going into it mainly for that reason, for that outcome, my advice would be not to do it because you might be really disappointed in the end. And above all, I think an entrepreneur has to believe in what they're doing. They have to have a philosophy that underpins the whole operation and then stay true to it. Okay, think. Am I out of battery? I'm out of battery. I can talk low. Um, Jesse, you want to do another battery for me? I'll repeat your question. Who has questions? I've got a question. Uh, before you guys uh, came in, we had SCORE and we had uh, Source Link and we had Ready and these people in here. And one of the continuing themes we heard from them was that as entrepreneurs were getting started and coming to them with their business plans, the, the one piece of it was the financial piece that was constantly the hurdle for people to get started. Um, Alan, you mentioned you know, you, you utilized your college credit card to get going. Um, but I'm, I'm interested to hear from the rest of you, not in specifics, but just was that an op, uh, a big obstacle to get over? And if so, how did you get through that? Ooh, I'll talk on this one. <laughs> um, well, I was lucky in 2006 before everything went really bad. Um, but we did an SBA loan. <clears throat> so um, we had saved some money knowing and then restaurants on top of, you know, 50% failure rate, it's 80% the first year, and two years later, it's another 80% of that 20% that made it. So financing was a big um, thing for us. They really, they made us accountable, um, but I probably went to seven different banks. Um, I, SCORE hates to hear this, but I actually walked away from SCORE um, because they were so negative about my idea and thought it was so such a terrible idea. Um, where that's where the resiliency comes in, but I had to have some money saved. For me, it's a little bit bigger operation than, you know, just getting to hire, I had to hire, I had 50 people when I started. Um, so it was, it was a big deal, and it probably took three to four months to put the financing together once the bank approved it. 
But again, it was where that tenacity and learning the finance part of it, um, every day that was a job looking at that loan application and filling it out and calling the next person. And um, Great opportunity actually, because I learned a ton, but SB was a huge, um, huge thing for, for us. So in my case, there is not much capital we need for our line of business, so I didn't really go to any bank or anything for a thing. But one thing I learned, again, what he said, like earn more, spend less. Um, so this is a really a fun, like after three or four years into business, uh, one of the banker called, uh, do you want a line of credit? I really don't know what line of credit at that point, even though I'm a business owner. So that's that's a one thing means I we have maintained a really a healthy b thing like uh, uh, like capital because I didn't spend much. I said whatever comes stays in the in the bank because we may need this money to uh, expand and that's the way I've done. I I've never went for a loan. I I never approached a bank. So so nothing much I could share there. Yeah, I would just add that eventually, you know, I, I did get an SBA loan uh, in 2004. It was for a building. I built a building so uh, for, for my company. So um, at that point, you know, again, I was probably only 25 years old asking for, you know, $800,000 from a bank. So, um, yeah, you eventually you kind of, depending on what type of business you have, you do need to take those avenues. I will say today it's it's hard if not almost impossible for banks to give you money and I'm a, I'm a business that's been around for 15 years and they still don't want to loan to you it's just the nature of where from what happened um, so those are things that uh, it is harder than it than it was so beg bar steal from family friends anybody that you're willing to, to to have help you out because that's really what you have to do yeah that, that is the reality um, the, the bank that we got a loan from um, just said, you know, it's really common when you're starting a business like this, a family loan or a friend, good friend, help you get over the hump initially. Um, we were trying to get a, a loan for, um, for trolleys um, uh, without much success in Rochester and through a personal connection, I, I, I went outside Rochester and uh, during the, the downturn, the farm economy still stayed really strong. So um, we were able to establish a, a great relationship with, uh, I'll just name, name the bank, uh, Foresight Bank in Plainview, formerly First National Bank. Um, and, and on the side, I call my wife the, the CFO, the Chief Financial Officer. So it wasn't easy to get a bank loan, but um, the bank that we met with uh, after not having much success uh, really believed in the idea. And I think they, they saw the future uh, of Rochester and said, hey, this is, a, this is a, a wonderful niche that's not being fulfilled and, and you've got experience doing it. Um, but with that said, um, most banks require you to bring X number of dollars to the table. And that's the challenge getting started, to, to bring, you know, to maybe take a company that was smaller and, and ramp it up, you know, adding trolleys, let's say in our case. Um, but, uh, yeah, and it's it's true. You're you're going to have better success with smaller banks if they you know than talking to a Wells Fargo or U.S. Bank. The smaller banks are usually locally owned. They might be a, a family that owns them. They have more decision making power on what they're going to do. Whether they believe in the person, they trust the person. They have the ability to decide whether or not they're going to give a ten thousand or twenty. You know, those are small loans compared to those banks. So um, you'll they'll have better opportunity going to talk to some of those smaller banks than they will a big. Corporation, because they just they're just going to look at the numbers and they're just going to look at the how much you owe and you either do do or do not qualify. So quickly on the practical side, with uh, referring to score, um, I, I had started a, a previous business in a really challenging time, a bookstore, and I did get advice, one-on-one uh, -on -one advice from a retired business exec at, at Score, and this person told me something that has played out and, and proved to be true. He said, "Your best friends will be your banker." your insurance agency, and your lawyer. And so far, two of the three, I really haven't need much legal advice yet. But I, but as far as insurance, you can imagine with trolleys and, and carrying passengers, it's a really big deal. And of course, to, to make a business happen, um, most of us need financing. 
Okay, I'm sorry, but we have to wrap it up now. And um, so I want to thank our panel. And I'm sure that if you have a question or something, we have their contact information. And you can uh, contact them and ask the questions that we didn't get time to, to talk about. So thank you very much.